Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of Real Talk with the Unicorn. My name is Tatiana and I'm a recruiter in supply chain and logistics. Today we are going to talk about a very interesting topic. We will talk about addictions. Sometimes addictions are not the ones that you may think of. They may not be substance related, they may not be drug related, they may be behavioral addictions. Those ones that affect the quality of your life, however you may not know you have them. My today's guest, my today's unicorn is Tanya McIntyre, certified addiction recovery coach, uh, smart recovery facilitator. Tanya spent over 22 years as a reporting journalist in mainstream media. And also Tanya had her own radio show, which is called Good News Only. Tanya, thank you very much for your time and welcome to my show. Thank you, Tatiana. It's so great to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, excellent. Uh, I'm in recruitment business and uh, addiction is not something that we deal with. Uh, however, I understand that certain behavioral patterns, certain unhealthy addictions, they affect performance at work, they affect your overall mental health, and they affect your relationship. How do you define addiction and what type of addictions you deal with and you deal with successfully? Uh, all kinds of addictions. Uh, addictive behavior can be anything. It can be eating, gambling, sex, pornography, drugs, alcohol, um, work, lots of workaholics out there. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to actually uh, see an increase of anxiety, depression, addictions uh, in the forefront of a lot of corporate life now because of what we're, we're now facing in this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And those behavioral addictions, um, you mentioned work. Um, is workaholism something that people should be concerned about? And how, do some, how does someone know that he or she is addicted? Like, are there any symptoms, red flags? Because as I mentioned in my introduction, sometimes we are addicted to things, but we don't actually realize that, that this is the chemistry, this is the brain pattern we are dealing with. How do you define it? And um, especially the work-related addictions. I think an addiction can be defined as uh, when you continuously do something that's giving you negative results. Mm -hmm. And, and by you, negative you results. just can't stop doing it. You continue doing it, even though you know it's unhealthy, it's not uh, productive, it's continuously giving you negative results, but you continuously do it. And then, then it's a problem. And uh, when you say negative results, does it mean unhappiness, unfulfilled life? Um, overweight, uh, so something that the person is concerned with, right? Absolutely, whatever's important to you, right? We all have our own currency. Mm -hmm. So whatever, whatever is giving you negative results, you know, it, it could be um, from a, a working standpoint, if you have family members telling you that they miss you at family events mm -hmm. um, repeatedly. Or maybe and, health, uh, your you know, your energy level suffers. Sometimes I think mm -hmm. even creativity may be affected if you have certain addictions. Uh, Tanya, is addiction for approval something that is frequent these days? Is this something that you hear a lot about? Like, you know, addiction to being accepted, being approved by others, because this is something that we find a lot in social media. We have mm -hmm. our emotional cravings and we go there uh, to sometimes validate ourselves. Is this something that can be described as addiction? I think it's normal. It's a normal part of just being human to seek approval outside of ourselves. That's how we're, we're programmed. That's the human condition. So I think it's normal um, as we're progressing through our life that we're always looking for um, praise and uh, endorsement and support and you know am i am i doing the right things um i need to be told that i need my validation outside of myself everybody likes to be complimented told how great a job they're doing mm -hmm. uh, even how good they look right i mean how often uh, does someone say something positive about your appearance and it makes you feel good and our performance is the same way you know we are we are uh, wired that way. It's hardwired in our DNA that we look for approval, even our, in our relationships. I've uh, been married uh, quite successfully and happily, I'd, I'd like to add as well, uh, for 29 years next month. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> That's um, a huge accomplishment. <laughs> well, yeah, I think maybe it is uh, nowadays, but I think any time of life, it's an accomplishment to maintain any relationship for 29 years successfully and, and relatively 
happily. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of joke with people all the time when they say, what's your secret to a happy marriage? And I say two bathrooms. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. That's helped a lot. It means um, some private space, some, um, you know, uh, some personal time, of course, having enough room in the house and uh, having yes. mental space for yourself is also very important for remaining yourself in the relationship, not uh, being dependent on the person and not adjusting yourself to the needs of the other person completely. Definitely. Setting boundaries is really important. And, and some people are challenged by that as well. I'm sorry. I think I may, may have gotten off topic on your question, Tatiana, which no, I will do. You don't have to read me in on that. That's absolutely fine. And uh, Tanya, when we speak about addictions and uh, especially during the pandemic, a lot of people move their focus from external world into social media. And sometimes they get, I wouldn't say brainwashed but they mm, become addicted to certain applications on their phone they check them more frequent than they used to you know you take your phone and your thumb just scrolls to certain apps sometimes you don't even want to do that but your body kind of does it for you and i'm wondering why do we develop those addictions why it is so difficult to break those painful patterns when you realize that it's not something you enjoy, but this is something you continue doing. Why is it so difficult? And what is the first step to the recovery? I think you had part of the answer in what you just described. It's a pattern. It's a pattern of behavior. It's a pattern we develop. It's a pattern of thought. And uh, you have to recognize those as being patterns. So in my uh, previous vocation as a broadcast journalist, you know, after a decade, I started to realize that there is an agenda of mainstream media, and that is to perpetuate what I like to call the FUD factor, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And when I say that, people say, oh, you're overreacting. And I'm thinking, well, no, I'm, I'm not really overreacting. You know, everything we watch, read, and hear is controlled by three to five, maybe, I think it's more like three or four now, American conglomerates. And that's always kind of been the way that we have been uh, conditioned, conditioned to be consumers. And the whole agenda of mainstream media is to keep us consuming and to create that hive mentality, right? Because hive mentality, and now more than ever in the digital world, uh, where the most valuable uh, data, in the most valuable thing now is data, our information, uh, which can even hone us further into a hive for marketing manipulation and targets. Mm -hmm. We as a species now are exposed to 3,000 advertising messages a day. So we're, we're spending about a third of our lives in front of a screen, probably more. And whether we know it or not, we are even just picking up through osmosis different advertising messages. And most of them are telling us that we're not good enough. We're inferior. We're never smart enough. We're never rich enough. We're never slim enough. That's for sure. Uh, we're never hairless enough until we go out and buy something or take something to feel better. So that's the whole purpose of mainstream media. So I think once you wake up to that, and it took me about 10 years of this vocation to think, wow, there, there are patterns here. And I didn't really um, appreciate it fully until I moved to Spain. So in Spain, after a couple of years, both my husband and I thought, hmm, okay, so we are living on the Mediterranean, so I'm sure that has a lot to do with it, but still, uh, just by virtue of not being able to understand all the marketing messages that were being blared at us, you know, just by virtue of not being able to understand the language, there was a different, we could feel a tangible difference. We were thinking better, we were speaking better, we were just feeling better. And I thought, oh, there's definitely a direct correlation to all of those messages that we receive as, you know, kind of like a mindless receptacle to all this BS, that there, there's a direct correlation to that absorption into our mind, which creates thought patterns, which makes us feel crappy until we go out and buy something or take something to feel better. Uh, Brené Brown, I don't know if you've heard of Brené yeah, Brown, Tatiana. I'm a big fan of Brené Brown. Yes, she's a best-selling author. Uh, so her vocation as a research professor has uncovered the fact that we now are the most stressed, depressed, overweight, over-medicated population in history. So there's a reason for that. And Tanya, I'm glad that you mentioned Spain. Uh, what it also tells me is that not that you withdrew that um, addiction aspect, that news aspect from your life, you were also very busy exploring new culture. 
Mm -hmm. so we were surrounded by interesting things, by, I don't know, new architecture, new landscaping. So we were probably taking pictures, you were meeting new people. So you being busy with something else, I think that also helped you forget about that. Because if you went somewhere where you've already been and by yourself, and there was nothing new to explore. At some point you would miss that feed, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. how important it is to rewire your brain. Like, what would be the first steps out of any addiction, whether it's behavioral addiction, substance misuse, drug misuse, what would be the first step and maybe the second, third, how you guide your clients through those journeys? Well, I think awareness is the big one. Mm -hmm. uh, I often joke with people that uh, you know, I've been on a recovery journey myself since 2009. And I say AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, a 12-step program, the most, one of the most popular ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I say, AA saved my life, and it did. But Smart Recovery gave me my life back. And what I like about Smart Recovery is that it's more secular, and it's based on cognitive behavioral therapy, which I can relate to, because you know, cognitively, I understand how our brain works. Mm -hmm. And I've grown to accept that most uh, addictive uh, disorders are um, a brain disorder. You know, it's, it's a substance use disorder. And I think um, the more we can appreciate it as being a brain disorder rather than a choice that people are making, then we can start, I think, to uh, widen the landscape of addiction recovery to encompass more effective treatments. But I think awareness is key. And what I loved about Smart Recovery is the, uh, like I said, the cognitive behavioral therapy approach. And they have four pillars. So the first pillar is the most important, is that you have to first develop and then maintain your commitment to abstaining from your addictive behavior. Mm -hmm. So the awareness, the admitting that you first have a problem, and then you need to develop the motivation to abstain from it and then maintain it. So that's the pillar one. The pillar number two of Smart Recovery is that then you have to learn how to handle your urges because urges are a big reason that people people give as oh you know i just couldn't stand the urge and i had to give into my addiction. flashback what they also call it right? yeah triggers flashbacks yes and then number three is uh, another biggie of course we then have to learn how to manage our thoughts feelings and behaviors so that's kind of part of my passion where we have to watch our language because the words that we formulate are feeding the thoughts which feed our moods and emotions which feed our results and behavior. So there's a direct correlation to how we're using our language. And um, you'd be interested to know, Tatiana, uh, I'm, I'm thinking with your accent, English is a second language for you. Well, yes, it is. It is <laughs> a second language. I admire anybody who can master English on top of another language because it's, uh, it's a very difficult language. And if you look at the English language dictionary, it also contains three times as many negative words as positive words. Really? So we actually, oh. yes, so we actually have to work three times as hard to formulate a positive thought. So it takes effort. But once you're aware of that, then managing your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors becomes more of a pattern, right? We're trying to create new healthy patterns. Mm -hmm. and, and then pillar four is finally where we all want to be, is living a balanced life. Balanced life. And what is balanced life? How do you interpret it for yourself? That looks different to everybody, right? My balance is going to be different than your balance. Yes. Um, a lot of people turn to medically assisted treatment. So mm -hmm. if you are on the disease side of uh, addiction, which a lot of people are, even a lot of people in the medical community, they use medically assisted treatments to overcome some addictive um, substance use disorders. Uh, the, I think the most common one would be most familiar to people because it's talked about most in mainstream media is heroin addiction, which is um, counterbalanced with methadone. So you, you hear a lot of negative stuff around that, but methadone is a medically assisted treatment. It's less harmful than heroin. It just needs to be managed properly and it's not being managed properly. Therein lies the problem. It works if it's managed properly. And Tanya, what you mentioned back to the smart uh, recovery, um, you mentioned that the first 
step, the very important one is awareness and understanding that you do have an addiction. And the second one you mentioned, urges. It's very hard to resist those urges, especially during the first week, month, or well, the first period of time. And if the person gives in to the urge, essentially when they realize what they've done, they feel extreme sense of guilt. They start punishing themselves. How do you deal with that? What do you tell them? And what did you tell yourself? Because you managed um, uh, to get out of addiction uh, yourself. I'm just wondering, was it successful for you right away? Or you had those um, incidents where you would give in to the urge? It's funny how you worded that, Tatiana. So again, awareness, oh, yeah. how, we're, <laughs> how we're using our language, okay? So the first thing, one of the first things you said uh, that I picked up on was it's very difficult to deal with urges. Do you remember saying that? Of course. And <laughs> so once you say that to yourself, what's it going to be? Difficult. It's going to be very difficult to deal with urges, <laughs> right? So the first thing I teach people to do is be aware of the language they're using to talk to themselves. Talk to ourselves like we talk to our best friends. That's the first thing we need to learn how to do. Because when we're feeding that negative narrative, it's feeding our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So if we go in to our recovery journey thinking that uh, urges are going to be overwhelming, urges are going to be, I'm going to be a struggle. It's going to be a constant struggle. Fight, 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 fight. If I'm thinking that going in, that's what I'm going to get. So cognitive behavioral therapy is key here because it creates a new pattern of thought, which is crucial in recovery. You know, I just started thinking, what would I tell my best friend if he or she asked me? I would probably say something like, it is not going to be easy, but you've managed it through harder things in your life. So this is something that you're very capable of, but it may take some time. So you will feel the urgency. Feel free to call me, connect with me. And we are going back to the support group, right? So how important is the support group and is the way I worded it something that you would approve from a coach perspective? Well, uh, yeah, manage is a really key word there. Mm -hmm. Capable, right? They're all empowering words, strength words. And that's what we want to really hone in on is that, you know what? Life is a challenge, right? I used to joke that uh, drugs and alcohol were my anesthetic through which I endured the operation of life. <laughs> So, so life is an operation, right? It's uh, whoever said life was going to be easy. We're expecting life to be easy. Life is not easy. The only constant in life is its inconstancy. It's, it's uncertainty uh, mm -hmm. more now than ever, right? Who, whoever thought that our generation would be faced with a pandemic like this. So, you know, life's uncertainty is certain. Life is going to change. It's not going to be easy. So once we accept that and we say, okay, so yes, I am strong and capable. So yeah. Maybe First, having, yeah. having a set of successful cases that you managed in your life and going back to that, rather than allowing your brain to tell you all those negative uh, thoughts, feed you all those negative thoughts, right? So maybe keeping some sort of journey and praising yourself. Um, I, I want to go back to that support group. Um, is it important to have someone cheer on you or people manage it quietly? Depends on the person, Tatiana. Um, you know, I mean, peer support is huge for some people. Mm -hmm. um, Smart Recovery has peer support on um, a more volunteer, like there's lots of peer support for volunteers. So I can tap into any kind of facilitator meeting at any time of day pretty much, and get support from my fellow facilitators in SMART. So I love that about it. Um, for, for a participant in SMART, could be a little more challenging because uh, we're all about independence, this being your journey. And I own your decision, be a yeah. in your life. Uh, I actually have this written because I'm a big fan of Dr. David Burns, who I think whoever created Smart Recovery, they probably read Dr. David Burns' uh, Feeling Good book from the 70s mm -hmm. uh, because everything that's in here is in Dr. David Burns' Feeling Good book. Uh, all, and he's kind of like the pioneer of cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral therapy for my generation. 
Uh, before that, it would have been like uh, the likes of Albert Ellis, I think was one of um, Dr. Burns's mentors. Mm -hmm. So the Smart Recovery Handbook has a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy templates in there, but also available on their website at smartrecovery.org. But I actually wrote this down because I get this question a lot. Everybody <laughs> says, a lot of people come to Smart Recovery from other 12-step programs and they say, what's the recovery success rate? They want to know. What's the recovery success rate? It's got to be better than those other 12-step programs that don't work, right? Wow. So this is, what, this is what they're coming into the program, that belief. Mm -hmm. So I say, and this came from Dr. David Burns. I wrote it down. I love him. Okay. The most crucial predictor of your recovery is going to be a persistent willingness to exert some effort to help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so true. And it, it actually resonates with me as a recruiter. I, I do help people to navigate through their career, to help them through the resume. And if I have an opportunity, of course, I'll find the best fit. But ultimately, your success, your career, your life is the result of the choices that you make. And when you make those choices, you are willing to take responsibility for any outcome, for any consequences. And uh, I think even having the set of values that you live by can help you with, that, with those decision-making um, milestones in your life because you can look back and say, well, I wouldn't do it differently because that doesn't meet my values. It doesn't meet my standards. I would have done it again and again. So not feeling guilty for your choices and owning that. And Tanya, that brings me to the next question. Is everyone prone to addiction? Are there people who are more immune to that? What affects um, us? Because I can speak for myself. If I see an ad in two days, I'm thinking of buying it. And, and, and I think it's kind of a red flag. <laughs> so, and um, is there, are there any risk groups and why people, some of, some of us fall into addictions easier than others? Well, there's a lot of theories around that. Um, I think recognizing that there's an urge to do something that you know is unhealthy, that's, that's kind of a, a red flag for me. Um, are there groups that are more prone? That is such a loaded question. I mean, I, I come from a long line of addicts in my family. So was I predisposed genetically to addiction? Maybe, but um, I've got other people in my family who, same thing, same environment, uh, same genetics, and they're not suffering with any kind of substance use disorder or any other addiction. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a, that depends on the individual. I think there are perhaps some, more, some groups that are more prone, if, especially if you come, uh, for instance, our indigenous people, mm -hmm. because there is a cycle of oppression there that I think is carried genetically from generation to generation to generation, for sure. I think uh, there's something in my DNA that's been carried from uh, my Scottish background, from my ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, so if there was that level of oppression, then perhaps that would make me more prone. It depends on, you know, again, so many different factors, Tatiana. I mean, that's, you could talk to 10 people and get 10 different answers. And I think it just depends entirely on the individual. And it also depends on a persistent willingness to exert some effort to help yourself. <laughs> yes, I, and that's, I actually love getting messages from my candidates sometimes saying that um, I have a good job, I'm happy with the pay, but I'm not happy with my feelings. I don't feel appreciated, I don't feel fulfilled. So it means that they do recognize, it means that in a year, in, in, in two years, maybe in 10 years, they will eventually get something that is going to satisfy the, them completely because they know what they're looking for. So when you know what you're looking for and you get it, you meet it, you see it, you will notice the feeling. Yeah, and I agree, Tatiana, that's key, is knowing what you want. And that's what another thing I love about Smart Recovery is that it asks you those deeper questions and encourages you to ask and answer them on a regular basis. So for instance, the uh, hierarchy of values. You'll notice if you get involved with Smart Recovery, they love acronyms. So the CBA is the cost benefit analysis. The HOV is the hierarchy of values. And the hierarchy of values is when you sit down with a piece of paper and you say, okay, what do I value in my life? You know, how often have we taken time to do that? Right? We're not really encouraged to do that. You kind of have an idea, especially. We think we have values, but when we sit down, can we list three, four? Right. 
you know, I, I, I've worked with, with people who I say, do, do a gratitude journal, just uh, write down three things you're grateful for before you go to bed. And they'll call me the next day and say, um, I couldn't think of three things. It's like, okay, so now we know what we need to work on. <laughs> right? Yes, exactly. I it's think just what a, an what awareness and being willing to ask and answer and sit with the feelings to contemplate, right? I mean, we just don't give our time, ourselves time to do that. And I think pandemic um, freed some time for that. And that's why we see those lineups to LCBO and we see other addiction issues coming in different directions because it freed up a lot of time for people. But we are not accustomed to handling that time effectively that would, you know, perpetuate our growth. Uh, do you see that trend? And what do you think about... Um, going into addiction rather than going taking that introspect journey well it's, it's not an easy journey to take which is why mm -hmm. most people stay stuck in addiction for a long long time because uh, you know there was a joke in aa we'd say denial is more than a big river in egypt because <laughs> you know we live in denial for a long long time because doing the work is now that I've got uh, so much sobriety behind me, mm -hmm. I, I can now appreciate that it took so much more effort and work to stay addicted than it does to stay sober. But when you're in your addiction, you can't appreciate that. You think, no, 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 I can't, I'm not, I'm, I just can't face that. I can't do it. So it's an excuse to just stay in addiction and stay in denial. And that th things aren't as bad as all that. Like I can still manage this. So it's I kind of a long time. dissonance, self-talk, telling yourself that others are in worse situations and looking for the proof of uh, the validity of your case. Um, you, Tanya, before you mentioned about suppression, suppression leads to uh, finding that relaxation and different um, drugs or substances. Um, People-pleasing syndrome. People get addicted to being good to everybody. So they please everyone around you to make sure that there is peace and they prefer to do that at their own expense rather than setting boundaries and having that pain of negotiation pain of conversation um, that addiction i suffered that from like for a long time and when you start setting those boundaries and of course people do not give up power without a good fight you start facing uh, those insecurities you start negotiating for yourself have you ever experienced that? And what do you think about people pleasing syndrome? It's, it's there for everybody. And it's, you're right. It's absolutely about being willing to set the boundaries. But again, that's a skill that a lot of people are reluctant to develop because they don't want to alienate people. They don't want to come across as, uh, you know, I've been called many times in my life, mm -hmm. a shit disturber. Why can't you just tow the corporate line and shut your mouth? Mm -hmm. So I had to make a decision. Do I stay in corporate and shut my mouth or do I continue being a shit disturber and try to do something else? So it's a choice that you may make. If, if you're setting boundaries in your life and you're still unhappy, then, then you've got a choice to make. Do I stay in something that's making me miserable? Do I set boundaries and see if I can be happy with that compromise in my life? Um, you know, it's, again, it's an individual thing. What are you willing to accept as being acceptable in, in life for yeah. that life balance. The life balance is huge. If you're going to a job that you hate every day and you're growing resentments around people that you're working with and you're struggling with addiction, it's only gonna get worse. Mm -hmm. And of course, for the managers, sometimes they see that people are not performing the way they used to and nobody really, not a lot of people are willing to explore it deeper and have an honest conversation with their employees. So they kind of try to push them harder. They want to uh, manage them by fear, manipulate them by fear of losing the job. But essentially the person may be suffering an addiction or two or even three. And that is something that I think each one of us is responsible for. If you understand that you don't have enough energy, if you feel that you are not as creative as you used to be, if you feel that you don't enjoy your work, it's, I think, a good exercise to explore where your energy is going through. Maybe you take all your vital energy to suppress the feelings that bother you. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing left for the work, for the family, and for the society. 
that's I think is also it comes down to choices tough choices and I think it starts with asking the tough questions like what do I want and what where are my values and how much am I willing to compromise those values to make a living and Tanya when I was looking at your um, career it doesn't kind of make sense from the first point of view because you work with mainstream media and this is the type of job that a lot of people dream of because you become famous you're always on tv and then you step out of that was that part of your um honest conversation with yourself uh, what and, and were there people who supported you or were there people who did not support you how did you handle that um society shifts because obviously you lost some friends i would assume Yes, I did. I had to leave that part of my life behind because, um, you know, when you make, when you draw a line in the sand the way I did in 2002, uh, mm -hmm. you're blacklisted from the community. So even if I wanted to go back and work in mainstream media, I wouldn't be able to find a job because that reputation stays with me forever. Mm -hmm. But I was prepared for that compromise because I wasn't willing to compromise my my morals anymore. It was chipping away at my soul and I wasn't prepared to do it anymore by just perpetuating American propaganda. So once I saw that, I, need, I needed to make a choice, something that defined me for all of my adult life at that time. If I don't do that, what will I do? Who will I be? Because it was defining me. Mm -hmm. So then I have to appreciate that that's how I, I was conditioned, right? We're all conditioned to pursue a vocation that becomes our life. It becomes who we are. What's the first thing we say to people when we meet them? What do you do? I'm a recruiter. I, I see myself through the work that I do. Exactly, we all do. So, you know, if we are defining our whole being, our whole uh, self-worth mm -hmm. by what we're doing in our vocation, then, you know, for me, it was quite a, a transition to then accept that I'm way more than what I've been doing for 20 odd years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's quite a, mm -hmm. a transcendence as well. And was it something that pushed you into your addiction or was that because losing friends, like even though you are prepared for it, you are certainly not prepared for being ignored by people who you trusted in the past. Was that the factor in your addiction? It took me a long time to appreciate that it was probably one of the best things that, that ever happened to me because mm -hmm. yes, it did spiral me into a, a downward uh, depths of addiction that I probably would have not seen if I hadn't made that decision. Mm -hmm. So it, it was good for me because then I had to accept that all that vocation ever did was feed my ego. So then that's another journey mm -hmm. in itself then is trying tough to one. transcend the tough ego. One. I, I keep... <laughs> Ego is a tough one to tame. Mm -hmm. It sure is. And I always love uh, deferring to people like Jim Carrey, right? So he's gone oh, from right. one extreme to another, right? Extreme poverty to extreme wealth. And he says, my wish for everybody is that they become rich and famous and have all their dreams fulfilled so they'll know that that is not the answer. <laughs> yes, that's... Uh... I, I actually enjoy him too because he went through the period of his time where he was absolutely alone and he still had to do his craft. And at some point he said, you gotta lose the audience. You gotta be absolutely comfortable in your own skin and do what you love. You get to be mentally prepared if all of them stand up and walk out of the building. You still stay on the stage and you still do what you do and you still believe in yourself. And that takes a huge inner strength that certainly gets developed through tough times. Like we are in right now when you look back and and when you look back at your life what you remember are those tough tough periods of life that you overcame absolutely Our memory and then, about happy days is relatively blur do you relate to that yourself definitely i think once i learned how to embrace failure as a, a learning opportunity it, it's always been that's for sure and it's learning to transcend those those challenges that that we're faced with you know and for me ego was a big one and it still is i still face it every day but i surround myself with people now who call me on it that's nice that, yeah. that's so nice of you to do that because ego breaks a lot of opportunities relationships careers and i think in our time selflessly serving others is the essential part of leadership 
And uh, if you are in your career for the reason to, to feed your ego, which grows really fast, at some point you will face that emptiness where you are surrounded by minions who are just there as yes men who won't argue with you uh, and you really lose that sense of reality. Yes. Oh. And I think we're seeing a big shift in how our society uh, places value now. At least I'm hoping that I'm hopeful that that's what we're seeing is that people are transcending capitalism in many ways and getting back to creating intentional communities. Oh, that's, I can speak for myself on our street. It's like an old fashioned community. Our kids, maybe 12 of them, play with each other. They drift from one house to another. We sit outside together. That would never happen if it wasn't for COVID-19. We have our own bubble and do some fun stuff with my neighbors. We talk to each other. It reminds me of that village that raises a kid. If my friend across the road wants to take a break, I have no problem having her child in my house and vice versa. It, we become closer to each other, we value the relationship, and it gives us this huge support that we were previously seeking in, I don't know, alcohol, shopping, um, some other distracting activities. Yes, I agree. That's amazing that you're doing that, Tatiana. That's great. And I'm seeing it more and more in, in even our community here. In Kitchener, same thing. That's great. Tanya, thank you so much for this conversation. I know that we just briefly surfaced, but I think we uncovered important topics that I think the most important message of our conversation is that you are the one in charge of your life. You are the one in charge of your happiness. Do not delegate it to others and work on your own energy. Try to find sources of energy that you know, try to find that yourself, become a better person, watch for your addictions, watch for the behaviors in you that you don't like, that don't bring you happiness and try to adjust. And I, please tell, if I haven't asked something that you wanted to share, because I'm not a big expert, I just asked questions that I would relate to and my audience would, but if there's anything else, if you have a message for everyone, please welcome. Well, thanks so much for the time, Tatiana. I really enjoyed talking to you, it went fast. Um, I just want to leave everybody uh, with my wish that you take the diet that really works, a media fast. <laughs> Don't watch, read, or listen to news and feel how much your life improves. <laughs> well, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> and of course, guys, if you want to chat with Tani, if you want to have a private consultation, I will leave all the contact information in the comments and Tani can be easily found on LinkedIn. So stay connected, network, be honest with yourself and don't be afraid to seek support. This is not the sign of weakness. This is actually the sign of strength. Be happy and enjoy life. Thank you for watching. Thanks, Tatiana. Thank you.